uncover your heads. We're going to stand and we're going to face Jerusalem. Please stand and face Jerusalem. We're going to open up. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts. And forgive us our debts. As we forgive our debtors. As we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. For thine is the kingdom. And the power. And the power. And the glory. And the glory. Forever. Forever. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. For he is good. For he is good. For his mercy endureth forever. Praise the Lord God of Israel. Praise the Lord God of Israel. For he is good. For he is good. For his mercy endureth forever. For his mercy endureth forever. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. The King of Kings. The King of Kings. And Lord of Lords. And Lord of Lords. Amen. Amen. Today, scripture reading comes from Proverbs, the first chapter, verse 7. Proverbs, the first chapter, verse 7. The fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. And instruction. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and doing of His word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, now we're gonna have a couple of songs from the, the kids' choir and the adults' choir. Happy Sabbath.
happy Sabbath.
Okay, let's give both choirs a, another hand for some beautiful selections. Praise to the Most High God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and peace to everyone that's here today in the name of Jesus. Peace to everyone that's watching us on the internet. And it's always good to stand before you on the Lord's Sabbath. And like we always do, we read out of the Bible, um, teach out of the Bible, and most importantly, we do what's written in the Bible. And today's lesson is titled, you know, the commandments or the laws of God existed in the beginning. Because most people know that the Lord wrote the Ten Commandments, but a lot of people don't understand that even though he had them written, they were already instilled in man in the beginning before they were written down. And we're going to show you that throughout this lesson, that the laws were good in the beginning, and they're going to be good all the way until the end. And that is what individuals are going to be judged on in the last day, whether you kept the commandments or not. Because it says in the Bible, the books were open. And those books are the words of God that Jesus taught us that we should teach, keep, and obey. But it all started in the beginning. You know, nothing changed. It was all in the beginning. And we're going to show you that. Let's go to Genesis 1. We're going to start this off in Genesis 1. And we're going to pick it up at verse 1. Genesis 1 and verse 1. Okay, when you get there, read it. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and he also had some commandments in the beginning. Because once he created mankind, he gave them some laws to keep. Go right into chapter 2. So after he is done with creating the creation, which he did in six days, he rested on the seventh, and that's where we get our seven-day week from, all the way in the beginning, way back in the beginning, seven-day week. Man tried to get around it, but, you know, eventually he had to end right back up with seven. And where did that come from? It was created in the beginning. Genesis 2 and verse 1, what does it say? Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. So God rested on the seventh day, which is an example to us. We're going to deal with that a little bit. What else did he do with that seventh day? And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. So that seventh day, which later became known as the Sabbath day, which means rest, God rested as an example for us to rest from our physical labors and to honor him. Skip down to verse 7 and read it. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So now he showed us how he created man. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So what are we going to do with this man? God created him. He created him for a purpose. Skip down to verse 15 and read it. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. So he gave a man a job to dress the garden and to keep it. And what else? And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So he created the man, gave him a job, and gave him some orders. He told him, Don't eat from this tree. Because the day you eat from that tree, you're going to die. So let's see who this was that did all this creating. Go to John chapter 1. So we just laying down a little bit of groundwork here before we get into the meat to let you know who did all of this and who gave all these commandments in the beginning. Because it's not hard. All you got to do is read the book. Genesis John 1 and verse 1. What does it say? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, 
And the word was God. We got two individuals in the beginning. Go ahead. The same was in the beginning with God. The same, which is the word, was in the beginning with God. Go ahead. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. All things were made by him, which is this word, in the beginning, and without him was not anything made that was made. Skip down to 14, and let's see what happened to this word. Go ahead. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So the word, which was God in the beginning, became a flesh and blood human being. And his name is Jesus. So God in the beginning became Jesus in the flesh, and he continued to teach what he set up in the beginning. All the laws and statutes and commandments that we need to keep. Change nothing, contrary to what modern day Christianity wants to say. Jesus didn't change anything. Now go to um, Isaiah 46. Isaiah 46. So y'all bear with this heat just for another week. It's all right. We're going to get through this. Take the lesson and fan yourself with it. We got plenty of cold water if you need it. Isaiah 46 and verse 9. This is Jesus right here. Go ahead. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. So this is the God we deal with. We say, I'm God, there is none else like me, none like me. I declare the end from the beginning. The script was already written in the beginning, what's going to happen to mankind in the end. It's all in the book. Because the Lord declares the end from the beginning. And the ancient times are things that are not yet. This is the only God that can do this. All the rest of them guys can't. Because they're false gods. We serve the one and true living God. Now let's go back to the beginning. Let's see what, what the Lord instituted in the beginning. Even though man trying to change it. It don't work with God. We have to conform our lifestyle to the book. We can't create God in our own image, which some people have done. Genesis 1. So he created man in the beginning. And let's see what he did with him. Genesis 1 and verse 26. Read it. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God said, this is the word doing all the talk. He said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air and over the cattle. And over all the earth and every creeping thing that creepeth on the earth. Go ahead. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So God created man in his own image. Male and female. And what did he tell them? Go ahead. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air. And over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, that's good. So the Lord created male and female and told them to do what? Be fruitful and multiply. If he created two men in the beginning, would not be no fruitful and multiplying. It don't work like that. Go to um, right into Genesis 2. So he created man first, but now you got to create a help me for the man. 18, what does it say? 2 and 18. And the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. So the Lord looked at Adam and said, it's not good that man should be alone. And it is not. So he said, I'm going to make him a help meet. Meet means good. 
He's going to make him some good help. Skip down to 21. Let's see how he did it. Read it. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib, which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. So he took the rib from Adam and made him a woman. He didn't go back into the ground and do it. He took it right out of man to let you know that this woman is a part of you. Go ahead. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. So now we got a, a law right here in the beginning which is called marriage. And it takes place between a man and a woman. This is way back here in the beginning. And throughout history, nothing's changed. It's still man and woman coming together to be fruitful and multiply. So when you get out of the norm, that's when you got problems. And when you get out of the norm and you start calling out of the norm normal, now you really got problems. And that's what they're doing today. They forgot what the Lord set up in the beginning. Ephesians 5. So marriage existed in the beginning. And it's a law because the Bible says that a woman is bound by the law, a wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. And what law is that? The law of marriage. And it was in the beginning. God set it up. Male and female. Ephesians 5 and verse 25. Ephesians 5 and 25. Read it. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So it says, husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church. The, the Lord's church is compared to as a woman, a bride, because he's the bridegroom and his church is the bride. And a bride is always the woman. That's what the books say. Two brides can't be married. You need a bride and a bridegroom. And two bridegrooms can't get married either. One of y'all going to be the bride. <laughs> Skip down to 28 and read it. So love your wives like the love, Lord loves the church. Go ahead. So are men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourish, nourisheth and cherish of it, even as the Lord, the church. For we are the members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. So we see Paul is teaching the same thing that was in the beginning. That man, male and female, come together, be fruitful and multiply, husband and wife. No different. But man decided to deviate from that, and it got him in trouble. Go to Genesis 18. Genesis 18. So if this was okay with God, then he should have had it written that it's okay to do this. But we see he didn't. Matter of fact, he condemned it all the way to the end but man thinks it's okay and they messing up society messing up the kids got the kids all jacked up now but the Lord gonna fix it 18 and 1 what it say and the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre and he sat in the tent of the door in the heat of the day and he lift up his eyes and looked and lo three men stood by him and when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground. So this is the Lord and two angels. They appeared to Abraham, and Abraham recognized them right off from the back. Go ahead. And said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little, let a little water, I pray you, be fetched, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread, and comfort ye your hearts. 
After that, ye shall pass on. For therefore are ye come to your servant. And they said, So do. And thou, and thou hast said. And Abraham hastened into, into the tent unto Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes upon the hearth. And, Abram, and Abraham ran unto the herd and fetched a calf, tender and good, and gave it unto a young man. He hasted to dress it, and so he hasted to dress it. So he about to make the Lord and them two angels something to eat, wash their feet, go ahead. And he took butter and milk and the calf which he had dressed and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree, and they did eat. So they eating now. And after they done eating, it's time for the conversation. Why you here, Lord? And he gonna let them know. Skip down to verse 16 and read it. And the men rose up from thence and looked toward Sodom. And Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. So now the Lord said, look, should I hide what I'm about to do from Abraham? Because I know he's going to be a just guy. He's going to keep all the commandments. Raise his kids right too. Go ahead. And the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous. Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and their sin is what? Very grievous. What sin? Sin is the transgression of the law. But what was they doing that was a sin? Because remember, this hadn't been written yet. Nothing's been etched in stone that thou shalt not do this. But this is a sin what they were doing. Go ahead. Uh, verse 21. I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it. Which is come unto me, and if not, I will know. So the Lord said, look, I got to go check this out. Because I know for sure I made male and female in the beginning. And they were supposed to come together. Now something's going on in Sodom that I got to check out. Go ahead. And the men turned their faces from thence and went toward Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. So the men left, the two angels left. So go right into chapter 19. We're going to fast forward to the story because Abraham tried to because Lot was there. He tried to talk the Lord down. To, you know, if it's 50 righteous, I won't kill the city. If it's 40, got them all the way down to 10. And the Lord said, okay, if I find 10 righteous people, I will not destroy the city. And let's see what happened. 19 and 1, what does it say? And there came two angels to Sodom at even. And Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them. And he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and ye shall rise up early and go your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. So Lot recognized them two angels too. They sat in the gate. Lot bowed himself to him and told him, Look, y'all come on into my house. You don't want to stay out in these streets, especially at night. Go ahead. And he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned in unto him, and entered into his house. And he made them a feast, and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. So he pressed upon them greatly, said, look, y'all don't want to be out in these streets. So they listened to him, and he made them something to eat. And they was eating and having a good time. And what happened? But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, can pass the house round both old and young, all the people from every quarter. So before they could lay down, the men, old and young, from the city, come past the house. That means they surrounded the house where they was at. And what did they say? Go ahead. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came in to thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. So that was the thing they was doing that was so grievous. Men sleeping with men. And these cats wasn't playing. They surrounded the house and they demanded Lot to bring them cats out 
so we can deal with them. And now they didn't want to shake their hand either and play spades and nothing like that. But keep reading. We got time. Keep reading, man. And Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him and said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. So even Lot knew this was a wicked act. How did it all of a sudden be so good and loving now? And the Lord called it wicked. So if it was wicked back then, guess what? It's still wicked today. No matter how they try to sugarcoat it and make it seem like it's all right, when God come down for some judgment, it's going to be a wrap. Read some more. Behold now, I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you. And, and do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing. For therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. So I guess that's like the lesser of two evils, right? Here, you can rape these women, but don't rape these men. But hey, Lot was trying to figure out a solution. It's like, look, dude, I got these two daughters, man. These are two women. Do what you want to do with them, but do not try to sleep with two men. What else? And they said, stand back. And they said again, this one fellow came into sojourn, and he will needs be a judge. Now will we deal worse with thee than with them. And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. So you see what their intention was. They told Lot, look, man, you coming in our city to live, and you're going to judge us? We're going to deal worse with you than with them. So they didn't have no good intentions for these guys from the beginning. They was going to rape them and go on about their business. Now, how can they, they told Lot, we're going to do what, what worse can they do with Lot? I mean, this is the mindset. So what happened? But the men put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the house to them and shut and shut to the door. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find the door. So the angel smote all the men with blindness. And that should have threw up a red flag. I was seeing one, this a minute ago I was seeing. Ready to get down. Now I can't see. Maybe I should go home. But what did they do? They were still trying to get in that house. The book said they wearied themselves to find that door. Go ahead. And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides, son-in-law, and thy sons, and thy daughters, and whatsoever thou hast in the city? Bring them out of this place, for we will destroy this place, because the cry of this is waxing great before the face of the Lord. So Lot told, the angels told Lot, You got anybody else? Get them out of here, because we're going to destroy this city. Because the cry is waxing great before the Lord. Go ahead. And the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, Up, oh, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. So he looked to the son-in-law and said, Look, we got to go, and they mocked him. But that was the mindset, man. A very grievous sin. Grievous. Let's see what the Lord said about it. Go to Leviticus 20. This is a serious sin when it comes to the Lord. But they didn't water it down. The Lord called it vile affection. Now they call it pride and love. But that's all right. Wait till the Lord come back. 20 and 13, one verse. Read it. If a man also lie with mankind as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. They shall surely be put to death. And that's what the Lord did to that entire city and the suburbs surrounding it. Killed everybody in there. And got it to a point where can't nothing grow there. Nothing. But it's all right now. Not to the God we serve. 1 Corinthians 6. I'll finish that. You finish? No. Read it. Their blood shall be upon them. That's right. Both of them. But they don't want to teach this, man. 
Sun worship has turned a blind eye to this to the point to where if they say anything about it, they're going to get you. Because the Bible's not supposed to be your moral code. And why did the Lord have it written there? 1 Corinthians 6 and 9, what does it say? Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? So these people ain't getting into the kingdom. Unrighteous, what else? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, fornicators, nor idolaters, idolaters, nor adulterers, adulterers, nor effeminate. Now we got fornicators that's sleeping around, adultery, sleeping around. What's an effeminate? Sleeping with another man, men sleeping with men, women with women. All those forms of fornication, right off the top. What else? No. Nor abusers of themselves with mankind. Abusers themselves with mankind. Nor thieves. Nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. So they ain't getting into the kingdom. They not getting in. Effeminates. You're not getting in. Go ahead. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the, of the Lord Jesus. So the sodomite can repent too, according to the book. They can repent and stop sinning against God. It's that simple. Don't give them a pat on the back and say, I understand you was born this way. That's crazy. You was not born that way. You choose the lifestyle of sin, just like everybody else. If you want to steal, you choose to steal. You want to kill somebody, you choose to kill somebody. You want to be a sodomite, you choose to be a sodomite. It's all sinning against God. And you have to repent from it. Romans 1, we finished that? And by the spirit of our God. That's right. So the Lord can fix you. You don't need to go to no psychologist. Take it to the Lord and truly repent. And he can fix you. Because the book say, with God, all things are possible. You can be fixed. Romans 1, 22. 1 and 22. Read it. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man. And that's what they did. They changed all the good laws of God to fit their own lifestyle. Go ahead. And to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worship and serve the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. So if you want to continue to do what's wrong, God will turn you over. And what does it say? God, gave, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts. God will give you up. That means when he give up on you, you it's a wrap. You're going to die in your iniquities. Go ahead. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affection. Vile affection. What is it? For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Women uh, with women. Vile affection. What else? And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. Men with men. Vile affection. And it said, look, they, you, they left the natural use. It's natural because the Lord set it up in the beginning. Male and female. That's natural. Anything other than that is vile affection. That's what God called it. And what are you going to do? Go ahead. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. And they did still want to retain God in their knowledge. So what did God do? He gave them over to the reprobate mind. 32. What does it say? Finished it? Yeah, keep reading. Read the reprobate mind. All the way through. 
Go ahead. To do those things which are not convenient. Go ahead. All right. Keep reading. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So if you go along with this stuff, you might as well commit the act yourself. Because you're going to get the same punishment. Servants of God don't turn a blind eye to no sin. We're going to point it out. Tell you, hey, you sin it against the Lord, fix it. So we can deliver ourselves. Like I said, I could see you in the restaurant with the whole hog on the table. And if I don't go in there and tell you the consequences of eating that hog, man, I'm in trouble. Because now I done gave you the option. I done told you the consequences, and now you make the choice after that. But you ain't going to get me in trouble. We have to warn people, because that's what the books say. Warn people about God and what he's going to do to you. Deuteronomy 23. Deuteronomy 23. So they're giving these individuals the okay to sin against God. And ain't nobody saying nothing, man. Nothing. Papa getting ready to make it okay. <laughs> Because it's been all up in this church for the longest. You can't hide too much, man. Either you're going to abolish it or you're going to go along with it. But let's see. 23 and 17, read it. There shall be no whore of the daughters of Israel. No whores of the daughters of Israel. What else? Nor a sodomite of the sons of Israel. And the sons of Israel, the men. No sodomites. Go ahead. Thou shalt not bring the hire of a whore or the price of a dog into the house of the Lord thy God for any vow. For even both of these are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. So the Lord calls the male sodomite a dog. That's what we just read. Don't bring the price of a dog. Because we know the whore is the daughter. So the dog is the man. Into the house of the Lord. Go to um, Revelation 22. Because we read in 1 Corinthians, the feminists ain't going to inherit the kingdom. Abusers of themselves with mankind, they ain't getting in. Let's see what the Lord say that's in the lake of fire. Twenty-two and fourteen. Revelation twenty-two and verse fourteen. Okay, read. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. So here's the last book, last chapter in the Bible, commandments still on the table. We read in the beginning, and now we're reading in the end. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and get into the kingdom. But what's on the outside? For without our dogs. Dogs. What we read a dog was a sodomite. In the lake of fire. Who else? And sorcerers, and whoremongers, and murderers, and idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. So we read this, man. They're not getting into the kingdom. Genesis 4. Now you can give them a pat on the back all you want. Pat them all the way to the lake of fire, because that's where they're going to end up. And you're going to end up right there with them, because you're patting them on the back. Telling them it's okay. And you can just see the progression of it, man. They out there now. In your face. All up in the school. Elementary school. K 
kindergarten. Genesis 4. Let's look at this. 4 and 1. Genesis 4 and verse 1. Read it. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain. Just like the Lord told him in the beginning, be fruitful and multiply. So he knew his wife Eve, and she bare Cain. Go ahead. And said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So Abel kept the sheep. Cain was the farmer. Go ahead. And, it, and in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and, and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. So they both brought an offering to the Lord. Abel brought the best. Cain just brought whatever. And the Lord didn't have respect for Cain's offering. Go ahead. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. So Cain got mad. Go ahead. And the Lord God said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. So the Lord told Cain, Look, what's wrong with you, man? If you do right, you're going to get accepted. If you do wrong, hey. Sin is waiting on you. Go ahead. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou, and thou shalt rule over him. Because he was already mad, and the book say, be angry and sin not. Go ahead. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. So I guess he didn't listen to the Lord, because he killed his own brother. The first murder killed his own brother. Go ahead. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? So the Lord asked Cain, Where is your brother, man? What did Cain tell him? And he said, I know not. Oh, uh, he over there in the field. I just bashed his head in. He lied. He said, I didn't know. So if murder was good, if murder was bad back then, it's, it's still bad today. And there was a law. He knew. He knew, but it hadn't been written yet. But murder was wrong. But he said, I don't know where he is. Go ahead. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, what hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. So he told him, what you done did, man? I know your brother's dead. But anyway, go to um, Exodus 20. So murder was bad, man. It was in the beginning. But now the Lord had it written. He chose him a nation and gave him good laws and good statutes. And they were supposed to be the model for the rest of the world on how to live and serve the God, true and living God. So he had it written. Genesis, Exodus 20 and 13, one verse. What does it say? Thou shalt not kill. Pretty simple, right? Don't kill. And if killing was okay, then Cain should have said, yeah, he right over there in the field. I killed him, but he lied. So he knew he was wrong what he did. Genesis 14. Let's look at this. Back up to Genesis 14. So we know that all of this stuff was instilled in man from the beginning. Because the Lord created man and gave them good laws and statutes to keep. Because remember, Israel ain't on the scene. Israel wasn't on the scene in the beginning. We had all kind of nations out there. And they all lived by some form of moral code on how to treat your fellow man. And let's look at this guy. Genesis 14 and verse 1, what does it say? And it came to pass in the days of Amphrael, king of Shinar, Ariot, king of Alessar, Shudder King of the Elam, and Tidal, King of Nations, that these made war, that these made war with Bera, King of Sodom, and with Bersha, King of Gomorrah, Shinab, King of Adma, and Shem Shemember, King of Zeboim. So now, these cats made war. 
And let's see what they did. Did you finish that? No. Read some more. And the king of Bela, which is Zoar. Okay, now skip down to verse 11 and read it. So they made war. And what happened? Go ahead. And they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their victuals and went their way. And they took Lot, Abram's brother, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. So now they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah, but they messed up when they took Lot. They messed up bad. Go ahead. And there came one that had escaped and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre the Amorite, brother of Esau, and brother of Aner, and these were confederate with Abram. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants born in his own house, three hundred and eighteen, and pursued them unto Dan. So when they told Abram that Lot got taken, Abram told three of his boys, let's go. We're getting ready to handle this business. Skip down to verse 17 and read it. My eyes is messed up again. Go ahead. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Shadalamer. So he went out and got everything back, Lot and all the goods, and he went out. Go ahead. And of the kings that were with him and the valley of Sheva, which is the king's dell. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. So he met Melchizedek. Brought forth bread and wine. He was a priest of the Most High God. That's another lesson. Keep coming around. We'll deal with it. But I'm only going here for this. Keep reading. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And he blessed, and blessed be the Most High God, which have delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. And he gave him tithes of all the stuff that he got back. Tithes, right? Way back here in the beginning. Ain't no Levite around. But some ties. Go to um, Genesis 29. 28, I'm sorry. Flip over to 28. And let's see what the tithe amount is. Genesis 28. Because Jacob had a dream. We ain't going to get into that. We just going here for this. And after he had the dream, he made a vow. 28 and verse 20. Go ahead. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. So Jacob said, all that the Lord is going to give him, he's going to break the Lord off a tenth. That's why the Bible say, all your increase. Get the Lord his right off the top. All he wants is a tenth. You find a dollar, get the Lord a dime. You get a hundred dollars, get the Lord ten. You go to casinos when they open back up fully again, you hit that slot machine. Make sure you get a Lord his before you put all the rest of that in there and lose it. Get a Lord his, put the Lord to the side because you got some increase there. And don't even think about taking the Lord's and try to put it back in there and get some more money. Go to Leviticus. Get a Lord his right off the top. Leviticus 27. I know how you get everybody get happy when they win some money. They want to win some more. And then you end up losing everything you want. Leviticus 27. And pick it up at verse 26. What does it say? Only the firstlings of the beast. Only the firstling of the beast, which should be the Lord's firstling. No man shall sanctify it, whether it be ox or sheep. So the it, firstlings, he want the best. Whether it be sheep or ox. Skip down to 30 and read it. It is the Lord's. And all the tithe of the lamb, whether of the seed of the lamb or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. And if, 
And if a man will at all redeem all of his tithes, he shall add there unto the fifth part thereof. And the concern and the concerning the tithe of the herd or of the flock, even of whatsoever passeth under the rod, the tenth shall be holy unto the Lord. He shall not search whether it be good or bad, neither shall he change it. And if he change it at all, then both of it, then then both it and the change thereof shall be holy. It shall not be redeemed. These are the commandments which the Lord commanded Moses for the children of Israel in Mount Sinai. So now these are the commandments, the tithe commandment, but it was already in the beginning. Give a tenth to the Lord. The servants of God did that. And then here he's talking about fruit, seed, cattle, and people stick with that and use that as an excuse not to pay tithe. Well, let's see some money. Go to 2 Kings. What were these guys doing? 2 Kings 12. Because people think when they pay tithes, you know, it's, it's a Sunday mentality, you know. That's why a lot of cats didn't want to get no offerings or no tithes because they think it went straight to the preacher because he had all them fancy cars and nice suits. And of course he was, you know, misusing the money. But that's why people don't pay. But hey, like I said, we don't pass no plate around. We teach you what's written, and it's up to you to whether you want to pay or not. Because you're paying tithes to the Lord, not to me, not to Elijah. That's between you and God. So now if you don't pay, don't make me no difference. Second Kings, chapter 12, and verse 1. Read it. In the seventh year of Jehu, Jehoash began to reign. In 40 years reigned he in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Zebiah of Beersheba. And Jehoash did that which was right in the sight of the Lord all his days, wherein Jehoadai the priest instructed him. So he did right, because he had a righteous priest instructing him on how to stay in, in good graces with the Lord. Go ahead. But the high places were not taken away. The people still sacrificed and burnt incense in the high places. And Jehoash said to the priest, All the money of the dedicated things that is brought into the house of the Lord, even the money of everyone that passeth the account, the money that every man is set at, and all the money that cometh into any man's heart to bring into the house of the Lord. So now we're talking about money. Go ahead. Let the priest take it to them, every man of his acquaintance, and let them repair the breaches of the house, wheresoever any breach shall be found. So they was taking that money, and they was repairing the house of the Lord. Go ahead. But it was so, that in, three and, that in the three and twentieth year of King Jehoash, the priest had not repaired the breaches of the house. Then King Jehoash called for Jehoiada the priest, and the other priests, and said unto them, Why repair ye not the breaches of the house? Now, therefore, receive no more money of your acquaintance, but deliver it for the breaches of the house. And the priest consented to receive no more money of the people, neither to repair the breaches of the house. But Jehoiada, the priest, took, of it, took a chest and bore it in a hole in the lid of it and set it beside the altar on the right side as one cometh into the house of the Lord. And the priest that kept the door put therein all the money that was brought into the house of the Lord. So the priest took a chest, bored a hole in it, and as the people was coming through, boom, dropping money, dropping money. Go ahead. And it was so, when they saw that there was much money in the chest, that the king's scribe and the high priest came up, and they put up in bags, and told the money that was found in the house of the Lord. And they gave the money, being told, into the hands of them that did the work, that the oversight of the house of the Lord... And they laid it out on the carpenters and builders that wrought upon the house of the Lord. So all this money that was coming in was to do what? Repair the house of the Lord. Because it takes money to do stuff like that. And the money came from the people to take care of what? The Lord's business. Go ahead. And to masons and hewers of stone and to buy timber and hew stone to repair the breaches of the house of the Lord. And for all that was laid out for the house to repair it. Howbeit, there were not made for the house of the Lord bowls of silver, snuffers, 
basins, trumpets, any vessels of gold or vessels of silver of the money that was brought into the house of the Lord. But they gave that to the workmen and repaired therewith the house of the Lord. Moreover, they reckoned not with the men into whose hand they delivered the money to be bestowed on workmen, for they dealt faithfully. So the ones they gave the money to, they didn't have to worry about them, you know, doing the dope fiend move on them. Because they trusted these guys. Here, take this money, buy whatever you need to take care of the Lord's business. They dealt faithfully with them. Go ahead. The trespass money and the sin money was not brought into the house of the Lord. It was the priest. So the trespass money and the sin money was not brought into the house of the Lord because what? It was the priest. So we're dealing with money here. And money is used to take care of the Lord's business. And where does that money come from? The tithes and the offerings that the people make. It's for the Lord's business. Go to Luke 18. Luke 18, and we're going to read verse 10. Luke 18, we're going to pick it up at verse 10. And we got two men going to pray. But the Pharisee's sticking his chest out, but I'm just going to here to show you that at least he was paying some tithes. 10 and 18 and 10, read it. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as the other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. So the Pharisee stood up, you know, and was pumping his own self up. God, I thank thee. I'm not like all like these cats over here. You know, an extortioner, or even this guy right here, this publican. I fast twice a week, and I give tithes of all I possess. Go ahead. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Okay. Genesis 20. So tithes was in the beginning. And it's still good to this day. Like everything is between you and the Lord. That's the only individual you should be trying to impress. And how do you impress the Lord? You keep his commandments. Real simple. Keep the law. Genesis 20. Let's look at this. Genesis 20 and verse 1. 20 and verse 1. Okay, read. And Abraham journeyed from thence toward the south country and dwelt between Kadesh and Shur and sojourned in Gerar. And Abraham said of Sarah his wife, She is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. So now Abraham said, look, Sarah, she my sister. So Abimelech the king, well, hey, she fair game then. Give her here. And he took her. Go ahead. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man. For the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a... For the woman which thou hast taken... For she is a man's wife. So God came to him in a dream and told him, look, partner, you dead because you got somebody's wife. Go ahead. But Abimelech had not come near her. And he said, Lord, wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? Said he not unto me. She is my sister. And she, even she herself, said he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands have I done this. So he hadn't touched her yet. That's why the Lord intervened. And he was like, look, I did this in innocence. He told me that was his sister. So I thought she was fair game. I didn't know. Go ahead. And God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that thou didst this in thine integrity of thy heart, for I, will also, for I also withheld thee from sinning against me. So he said, I know you did this at the integrity of your heart, so I have also withheld you from doing what? Sinning. 
And what was the sin he was about to commit? Adultery. But had it been written yet? Nope. But we knew it was still back here in the beginning. Israel wasn't on the scene. Israel was not on the scene, but adultery was wrong back then, and it's wrong today. Keep reading. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. Now therefore restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet, and he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know thou that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. Therefore Abimelech rose early in the morning and called his servants and told all these things to their ears and the men were so afraid so that was a nightmare for him the book called it a dream but hey when he woke up he was scared and he told all them cats that was with him and everybody got scared and what did they do go ahead then Abimelech called Abraham and said unto him what hast thou done unto us he called Abraham and said man what you done did to us what did I do go ahead and what have I offended thee, that thou hast brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin? A great sin. Remember that, a great sin. Go ahead. Thou hast done deeds unto me that ought not to be done. And Abimelech said unto Abraham, What sawest thou, that thou hast done this thing? And Abraham said, Because I thought, Surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will slay me for my wife's sake. And yet, indeed, she is my sister. She is the daughter of my father but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. And it came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house that I said unto her, This is thy kindness which thou shalt shew unto me. At every place whither we shall come, say of me, he is my brother. And Abimelech took sheep and oxen and men servants and women servants and gave them unto Abraham and restored him Sarah his wife. And Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before thee. Dwell where it pleaseth thee. And, and unto Sarah he said, Behold, I have given thy brother a thousand pieces of silver. Behold, he is to thee a covering of the eyes, unto all that are with thee, and with all other, thus she was reproved. So Abraham got a, came out pretty good out of this deal, man. What else? So Abraham prayed unto God, and God healed Abimelech, and his wife, and his maidservants, and they bare children. For the Lord had fast closed up all the wounds of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. So you see what the Lord did? Because of Sarah, Abraham's wife, the Lord closed up all the wounds of the women. And the books say fast closed. That means what? nothing coming out. But anyway, <laughs> go to <laughs> flip over to chapter 26 because Isaac did the same thing with his wife, Rebekah. And this was with an Egyptian. 26, and pick it up at verse 6. 26 and 6. What does it say? And Isaac dwelt in Gerar, and the men of the place asked him of his wife. And he said, she is my sister. For he feared to say, she is my wife. Now Abraham, he was pretty legitimate in that, because you know, that was his sister. But Rebecca was not his sister. That was his wife. But he got scared. Go ahead. Let said he, the men of the place should kill me for Rebecca because she was fair to look upon. So she was a good, Rebecca was a good looking woman in other words. And it seemed like, uh, well, keep reading. And it came to pass when he had been there a long time that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out at, looked out at a window and saw and behold, Isaac was sporting with Rebekah, his wife. So here's a Philistine. Abimelech looked out at the window and he saw, wait a minute. He was sporting with his wife. What, well, you know what sporting is. And he's like, wait a minute, that's his sister. What is this? Go ahead. And Abimelech called Isaac and said, behold, of a surety she is thy wife. And how sayest thou, she is my sister. And Isaac said unto him, because I said lest I die for her. And Abimelech said, What is this that thou hast done unto us? One of the people might lightly have leaned, lying with thy wife, and thou shouldest have brought guiltiness upon us. So even these Philistines, they had some kind of moral code to say, Hey, 
we know we ain't supposed to be sleeping with somebody's wife. So why did you tell us that that was your sister? Because somebody might have slept with her. And then you would have got all of us in trouble. Go ahead. And Abimelech charged all his people, saying, He that touch of this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. So Abimelech charged all the people, Don't touch Rebekah. Because if you do, I'm going to kill you. That's how serious he was. That's how serious adultery is. But people take it lightly nowadays. Go to Genesis 39. Got people sleeping around like it ain't nothing. Hollywood is full of it. Like it ain't nothing. Genesis 39. And pick it up at verse 1. 39 and 1. What is say? And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him out of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph got sold to the Egyptians. He was in Potiphar's house. The Lord was with him, so he was prospering. And as long as Joseph was prospering, Potiphar's house was doing good too. Verse 4, go ahead. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him, and he made him overseer over his house, and all that he had he put into his hand. So he made him overseer of all his house. Go ahead. And it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house, and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. So the blessing, because the Lord was with Joseph, and he blessed Joseph, he blessed the Egyptian's house. Go ahead. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not, and he knew not aught he had, save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. So this is a guy that, hey, I can go home, I can go to work, and I ain't got to worry about Joseph doing nothing wrong, even messing with my wife. But see, he couldn't trust his wife. That's the thing. He could trust Joseph, but his wife was something else. Go ahead. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, lie with me. Straight to the point. Come on. Go ahead. But he refused, and he said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wardeth not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. So Joseph was an honorable man. He was a servant of God. He said, Look, the master left me in charge of everything, gave it all to me except for you. Go ahead. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? How can I do this great wickedness and do what? Sleep with somebody else's wife. And it hadn't been written yet. But it was already instilled in man. Not to sleep with somebody else's wife. We finished that. Verse 10. Read verse 10. And it came to pass, as she spake to Joseph day by day, that he hearkened not unto her. So she was driving reckless on him every day. The man couldn't get no rest because she was on him. And we know what happened. She attacked him and he ran out. And she came home and told her husband that he tried to rape her. All because he wouldn't sleep with her. All because the man didn't want to sin against God. Now let's move on. Finish. Huh? Finish that last part. Yeah, finish that last part. To lie by her or to be with her. That's right. Leviticus 20. We could have read it in Exodus. In the, it's in the commandments, but I want to read it here to let you know the consequences of it. And adultery is on the books, man. They got it as a law. Because they just took it off the books in Korea. So 
So what's on here? It's just one of them laws that they don't enforce. Like sodomy used to be against the law. As a matter of fact, it was a felony back in the 60s if they caught you out the closet. A felony. But now, well, y'all know. Leviticus 21 verse, verse 10, what does it say? And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Surely be put to death for sleeping with somebody else's wife. That's how serious the Lord is about it. Now go to John 8. Yep. John chapter 8. Start at verse 1. And this, they're always messing with Jesus, man. All the time. Scribes and the Pharisees messing with him. Let's see what, the, what they did. Verse 8, chapter 8 and 1. What does it say? Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. A woman taken in adultery by herself. Where's the man? It takes two to do this. But remember, they was messing with Jesus, tempting him. Go ahead. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. In the very act. Caught her. Where is the man? Go ahead. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? So they asked him. The law commanded us that she should be stoned. What do you think? What did he tell them? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself. So Jesus ignored them for a little bit, but they kept pressing on him. And then what did he tell them? Go ahead. And said unto them, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast the stone at her. So Jesus said, all right, kill her. If any of y'all has not sinned, y'all be the first ones to throw the first rock. So Jesus actually said, okay, yeah, I know. If she committed adultery, she deserved to die. But y'all ain't going to do it because y'all just as dirty as she is. Go ahead. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they, and they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Have no man condemned thee? So he said, Woman, where your accusers at? Has anybody condemned you? And what did Jesus say? Go ahead. She said, no man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. So Jesus forgave this woman. Even though she deserved to die, according to the law, he had mercy on her and said, Look, I don't condemn you, but look, don't do no more sinning. You're getting the pass right now. Don't go out there and act a fool no more. Go to um, Genesis 7. Genesis 7. We're going to try to get through this because we got to get to this baptism. Genesis 7. And pick it up at verse 1. Genesis 7. So adultery was wrong in the beginning, and it's wrong today. Seven and one. The world become wicked. The Lord said, I'm going to drown everybody. So he told Noah, build this boat and take you, your wife, your three sons and their wives, and the animals too. But you can't take all the animals. Only a certain number are going to make the cut. 
Read it. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and, and all in thy house into the ark. For thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Of every clean beast thou shalt take, a, take to thee by sevens, the male and his female. So there's clean beast. What's a clean beast? I guess it smell good or something. What else? And of the beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female. Well, what's a not clean beast? Maybe they don't smell as good. It's got to be something between clean and unclean, but we're going to find out. Go ahead. Of fowls also of the air, by sevens, the male and the female, to keep the seed alive upon the face of all the earth. For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth, forty days and forty nights. And every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. And Noah did according unto all that the Lord commanded him. And Noah was six hundred years old when the flood of the waters was upon the earth. And Noah went in, and his sons, and his wife, and his sons' wives, with him, into the ark, because of the waters of the flood, of clean beasts, and of beasts that are not clean, and of fowls, and of everything that creepeth upon the earth. There went in two, there went in two and two unto Noah into the ark, and male and the female, as God had commanded Noah. So the clean beasts and the not clean beasts, we got to find out what that is, man. Because this is stuff way back in the beginning. Flip over to chapter 9. Chapter 9. So now the water's receded and they're coming out. And what did he tell the animals? Go ahead. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth. And upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth, and upon all the fishes of the sea, into your hand are they delivered. So now the fear you and the dread of you is on every beast, and every fowl of the air, and all that move on the earth, and all the fishes in the sea, and in your hands they delivered. Go ahead. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. So everything that moves shall be meat, even just like the green herb. Go ahead. But flesh, but flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. But don't eat the flesh with the blood in it. So the food got to be cooked. None of this medium rare. None of this. I can't see how people eat a rare steak anyway. You can't even chew it. You ain't got the teeth to chew it. So it's got to be cooked. Now flip over to Leviticus. So we can find out about this clean and unclean. Let's see what it means. Because if he said you can eat it now. Leviticus 46, 11, and chapter 40. Chapter 11 and verse 46. Read it. This is the law of the beast and of the fowl and of every living creature that moveth in the waters. And of every creature that creepeth upon the earth. So this is a law. Now the law is being written. Law of the beasts, of the fowl, every living creature that moveth in the waters, every creature that creepeth upon the earth, to do what? To make a difference between the unclean and the clean. To make a difference between the unclean and the clean. Go ahead. And between the beast that may be eaten and the beast that may not be eaten. So clean means you can eat it. Not clean or unclean means you can't eat it. And that was way back here in the beginning that the Lord set up stuff for us to eat and told us stuff that we can't eat way back in the beginning. But people have belittled this and said, you don't have to do this no more. Go to Acts 10. And they use this script to do it. Acts chapter 10. And Peter knew. That's why they go to them funny Bibles and try to say Jesus said he made all things clean. And it had nothing to do with that. It was about washing hands, eating food with dirty hands. That's all it was. Because if that was the case, if I had been around walking with him back then and he said that, I would have went and got me some chitlins. 
but we know that's not what it was all about. 10 and 9, read it. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the, house to, on the, upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while, they, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven open and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. So Peter had this vision. He saw a vessel descending like a great sheet and all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. What did the voice tell him? Go ahead. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter. Kill and eat. Rise, Peter. Kill and eat. What did Peter tell him? But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. So we know what was on that vessel that he saw, that sheep. It said all manner. But Peter said, Look, I have never eaten anything common or unclean. Or unclean. But we know he was talking about people, but then that's another lesson. But I just came here to show you that even after Jesus died, they were still adhering to the dietary law. Even in a vision from God, Peter was like, wait a minute. <laughs> I don't know about this. I'm going to say no three times. And then I'm going to think about it. Once I come out of this trance, I'm going to think about it. Hey, what's going on here? And the Lord revealed it to him. It wasn't about animals and eating pig and all that stuff. It was about bringing the stranger into the church now. Now go to um, Isaiah 66. Because if that's the case, if the Lord said it's okay to eat pig now, then why would he have this written? Because when he come back and you still got to play the chitlins, he going to take you out. Isaiah 66 and verse 15. 66 and 15. Read it. For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. So now this is Jesus and coming back and he mad. Go ahead. For by fire and by his sword will the Lord plead with all flesh and the slain of the Lord shall be many. So when God get mad, a lot of people got to die. Lots of people. He said many times to Israel, I will consume thee in a moment. What else? They that sanctify themselves. So these are the ones that's going to be killed, the ones that sanctify themselves. Go ahead. And purify themselves in the gardens, behind one tree in the midst. And the ones that's purifying themselves in the garden, behind one tree in the midst. What else? Eating swine's flesh. Eating swine's flesh. So if it's okay to eat the pig now, why is the Lord going to kill you for eating it when he come back? That don't make no sense. Go ahead. And the abomination. And the mouse shall be consumed together, saith the Lord. And the abomination and the mouse too, because we know people eat mice, rats. People eat a whole lot of stuff. Cats and dogs too. They're going to be consumed together, saith the Lord. Now go to Deuteronomy 5. 18. Read 18. I'm sorry. For I know their works and their thoughts. It shall come. It shall come that I will gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. Okay. Now let's go to Deuteronomy 5. Because we know in the beginning, we read in the beginning of the lesson, that the Lord set up the seventh day week. And the book said he blessed the seventh day and set it apart. And then he had it written, Deuteronomy 5. And pick it up at verse 12. Deuteronomy 5 and verse 12. Okay, read. Keep the Sabbath day to sanctify it, as the Lord thy God have commanded thee. Keep the Sabbath day. Sanctify it, just like the Lord said. Go ahead. Six days thou shalt labor, and do all thy work. Six days. 
Go ahead. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. The seventh day is the Lord's Sabbath. Remember that. It's the Lord's Sabbath. It ain't mine. It ain't yours. It's the Lord's. Go ahead. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thine ox, nor thine ass, nor any of thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates, that, that thy manservant and thy maidservant may rest as well as thou. So everybody's supposed to rest on this day. Go ahead. And remember that thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt. Remember you was a slave. Go ahead. And that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. Keep the Sabbath. Keep it. Acts 17. Nothing's changed. How are you going to set something up in the beginning and come in the flesh and say, uh, like the governor, you know, uh, I was wrong. You can do Sunday now. Because I rose on Sunday. Can't read that nowhere in the book. That other Jesus is double-minded, like James said. He tell you one thing and then come back and say something else. I was wrong. You can do Sunday now. Let's see what the disciples was doing. If they was keeping Sunday. Acts 17 and verse 1. What does it say? Now when they had passed through Amphipolos and Apollonia. They came to Thessalonica. Where, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul as his manner was. Went in unto them. And three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures. And Paul as his manner was. Went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And reasoned with them out of the scriptures. What else? Opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead. And, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas. And of the devout Greeks a, mul a great multitude. And of the chief women not a few. So some believed. It's just like now we've been conditioned so long to do Sunday. That when we come into this truth. It's hard for some of us to break away from it. It take a little more time. Some of us can do it right away because the light is turned on like that. What? I'm done with it. Some, it's a gradual process, but eventually you get to it. And then you try to bring it to everybody else, and it's like pulling teeth, man. But we got to remember, you know, we were stuck in that same situation. But we came out of it. We can't expect them to come out as fast as we did. You just got to be a light to them. You may not reach them. You might reach their kids. Grown nieces and nephews might see your example. But that's what we're doing. So now let's look at this guy. We're going to look at the handout. Because we know the laws existed in the beginning. And it was for all mankind. Now let's look at this guy. His name is Hammurabi. We're going to read it out of the pictorial Bible dictionary. Let's see what he's talking about. Because he was pre-Israel. Way before Israel. And let's see what his, what kind of stuff he was governing the people with. Okay, read it, man. Everything till I tell you to stop. Hammur Hammurabi, the king of the city of Babylon who brought that city to its century and a half rule over southern Mesopotamia, known as the Old Babylonian Kingdom. He was an Amorite, the name given to a Semitic group which has invaded the Fertile Crescent about 2000 B.C., destroying its civilization and establishing their own Semitic culture. There has been considerable difference of opinion about the date of his reign. Recent scholars favoring 1728 to 1686 BC. Hammurabi made Babylon one of the great cities of the ancient world. Archaeology, archaeology, thank you. 
have discovered that in his city of the streets were laid out in the straight, straight lines which intersect approximately at the right angles. An innovation which bears witness to the city planning and strong central government. Little known in Babylon before this time, Marduk, the god of Babylon, now became the head of the pantheon in his temple. Etemanaki, one of the wonders of the ancient world. Many letters written by Hammurabi have been found. These, these show his close attention to the details of his realm and enable us to call him an energetic and benevolent ruler. Hammurabi began the first golden age of Babylon, the second being that of Nebuchadnezzar over a thousand years later. He systematically unified all of the old world of Sumer and Akkad, southern Mesopotamia, under his strongly centralized government. The prologue to his famous law code describes his administration, Anu and Enil, en Enlil, the sky and the storm gods, named Name me to promote the welfare of the people. Me, Hammurabi, the devout, God-fearing prince, to cause justice to prevail in the land, to destroy the wicked and the evil, that the strong might not oppress the weak, to rise like the sun over the black-headed people, and to the light up, up the land. Hammurabi the shepherd, called by Enlil, am I, the one who makes affluence and plenty abound. The one revived Uruk, who supplied water in abundance to its people. The one who brings joy to Borsippa. Okay, let's skip down to um, by far. The next page over. I mean, the next thing over. By far. Go ahead, read that. By far, his most famous claim to fame is Hammurabi's Law Code. It is inscribed on a magnificent steel of black di diorite, eight feet high. Found at Susa in 1902. Formerly it had stood in Babylon, but the Elamites carried it off when they conquered Babylon in the 12th century BC. It is now in the lower of Paris, and at the top of the still is finely sculpted scene showing Hammurabi standing before the sun god Shamash, the patron of the law and justice, who is seated and is giving to Hammurabi the laws. Beneath in 51 columns of the text are the laws in beautiful cuneiform characters okay so let's read some of this stuff skip down to the law code itself let's see some of the stuff he had written go ahead the law code itself included nearly 300 paragraphs of legal provisions touching commercial social domestic and moral life there are regulations governing such matters as liability for an and exemption from military service control of trade and alcoholic drinks banking and usury the responsibility of man toward his wife and children, including the liability of a husband for the payment of his wife's debts. Hammurabi's code was harsher on upper class offenders than on a commoner committing the same offense. So, you know, he, at least he was, it's upside down now. You know, rich folks get away with everything. And it's harder on the poor people. But go ahead. Death was the penalty not only for homicide, but for theft, adultery, and bearing false witness in the cases involving the accused life. But the graded penalties show a great advance on primitive laws, and contemporary legal texts show that the harsher penalties were rarely exacted. Women's rights were safeguarded. A neglected wife could obtain a divorce. A concubine who had become a mother was entitled to the restitution of whatever she had brought with her, or or in a pecuniary indemnity appropriate to her social position. If a house fell on its owner or a doctor injured his patient, the man who built the house or treated the patient might suffer death, mutilation, or at least a heavy fine. So this cat, you know, he had a little, you know, something on it, you know, some ethics. You know, malpractice. We see that malpractice right there, right? Or if the house fell on you, you go get the general, the one that built it. What else? Yeah. All right. Students of the Bible are especially, in, especially interested in the comparison of Hammurabi's code with the Mosaic legislation of the Bible. There are many similarities. And both a false witness is to be punished with the penalty he had thought to bring upon the other man. Kidnapping and housebreaking were capital offenses in both. The biblical law of divorce permits a man to put away his wife, 
but does not extend to her the same right as did Hammurabi. Both codes agree in prescribing the death penalty for adultery. The principle of retaliation upon which a number of Hammurabi's law were based vividly and stated in Exodus 21, 23 through 25. But we already, we've been reading in the beginning the Lord had all this stuff written down before he had it etched in stone. So all these nations had some form of moral code. Like Abimelech, the Philistine, he knew that it was wrong to sleep with somebody's wife. Joseph, the Israelite, knew it was wrong to sleep with somebody's wife. Cain knew it was wrong to kill Abel. So it was all there in the beginning. And this guy, Hammurabi, he wrote this thing down, his code, had it written, they found it, and they was like, wait a minute. He wrote all this stuff before it was written, given to the Israelites. So now they're trying to discredit the Bible. But they failed to realize that this stuff was around before the Lord had it written. It was among all the nations. All these nations out here got some kind of moral code, man. And if you go back, even though it's written, it was around before it was written down, pretty much, if you understand what I'm saying. But y'all know what I'm talking about. Let's get back to the book. No, wait a minute. Read some more. Keep reading. How are these similarities to be explained? It is obvious that Hammurabi's could not have borrowed from Moses, for the Hebrew lawgiver lived several centuries after the Babylonian. Direct, direct borrowing in the other direction also seems very unlikely. Most scholars today agree that similarities are to be explained by the common black background of the Hebrews and Babylonians. Both, both were Semitic peoples inheriting their customs and their laws from their common ancestors. At first, this explanation would seem to run counter to the biblical claim that Moses' law was given to the legislator by divine revelation. A closer examination of this Pentateuch will show that the Hebrews before they came to Sinai followed many of the regulations set forth in the law. And we read that. Joseph, he didn't do no adultery. He knew it was wrong. Go ahead. Moses' law consists of the things both old and new. What, what was old? The customs of the Hebrews received from their ancient Semitic ancestors was here formally incorporated in the nation's constitution. Much is new especially the high views of the nature of Jehovah and the idea that law is an expression of this nature. Formerly, many scholars identified the Amarphel, king of Shinar, whose invasion of the tra Transjordan is described in Genesis 14, 1-12, with Hammurabi, king of Babylon. Recently, this identification has generally been given up. The two names are not the same, and the chronological problems raise by the new low date for Hammurabi makes their equivalence very unlikely. Okay, now let's go to the book, John 14. We got one more place after this, and then we're going to get to this baptism. John 14. So Jesus gave us this stuff in the beginning, and he came in the flesh and told us point blank, you still got to keep him. And if you follow my example, and you love me, you're going to do this. John 14 and verse 15, what does it say? If you love me, keep my commandments. And this is Jesus. If you love me, keep my commandments. Skip down to 21 and read it. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he is that loveth, he, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him. And will manifest myself to him. So if you love me and keep my commandments, you love the Father. 23, what does it say? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and he will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. So Jesus said, look, pay attention to this, man. If a man love me, 
He's going to keep my words. And my father will love him. And we will come into him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. And the word which ye hear is not mine. But the father which sent me. Remember that. Jesus said, my doctrine is not mine, it's the Father who sent me. I'm only speaking what he told me to say. And if you reject what I'm telling you, you're rejecting the Father, and in the end it's going to be a wrap for you. Is that it? 25. Read 25. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. Okay, now let's go to the last place, Second John. So these commandments that we're reading, it's nothing new. They've been around since the beginning. We're going to let the Bible tell you that. Second John. It's only one book, one chapter. Read it. The elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all they that have known the truth, for the truth's sake which dwelleth in us, and shall be with us forever. Grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I rejoice greatly that I have found of thy children walking in truth, as we have received a commandment from the Father. From who? From the Father. I rejoice greatly and found the children walking in the truth as we receive commandment from the Father. Go ahead. And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment I unto ain't thee. I write nothing new. Go ahead. But that which we have from the beginning, that we love one another. And this, and this is the love that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment, that as ye have heard from the beginning, ye shall walk in it. So this is the commandment. That you heard from when? The beginning. Because they've been around. Before they was written in stone, the commandments were here. We read too many examples. So that's the laws of God or the commandments existed in the beginning. And I hope you got some understanding in Jesus' name. Okay, we're going to read the announcements. We welcome you and hope today's lesson increased your knowledge of the Holy Bible. CDs and DVDs of the Sabbath lessons are available. Please place your order and donation in an offering envelope and it will be filled on the next Sabbath. The children's class ages 3 to 5 and 6 to 12 starts at the same time as the adult Sabbath lesson in the assigned location. Bring your child so that their knowledge may be increased. Train up a child in the way that he should go and when he is old he will not depart from it. Proverbs 22 and 6. Adult question and answer is from 4.30 to 6.30 after the Sabbath lesson. Team form every other Sabbath at 4.30. We have question and answer every Wednesday at 5 p.m. via telephone conference line. The number and access code are located at the top of the lesson. Or see the live stream of question and answer at www.thykingdomcome7.com. If you are interested in being baptized, please place your name on the list at the reader's table. Remember to follow the dress code when attending our services. Men should remove all hats and all head coverings during the service times. Shorts are not permissible. Women should wear a head covering, such as a hat or scarf during the service. Women should not wear tight-fitting pants or skirts or revealing clothing. Attire should be modest according to the Bible. If your child becomes restless during the Bible lesson, we encourage you to remove your child from the room until he or she has settled. Your tithes and offerings are always appreciated. Please place your tithes and offerings in an offering envelope and deposit it in the offering box. Your cooperation is greatly appreciated. Again, thank you for coming, and we hope to see you on the next Sabbath. Peace. Peace. Okay, just a couple of announcements. Uh, those that are getting baptized, you better go change right now. Because... Um, We're going to go over a few scriptures, and then we're going to go ahead and take care of the Lord's business. But as far as the announcements go, we're going to have an all-hands cleanup on the 13th, September the 13th. That's a Sunday. 
because the Memorial of Trumpets starts that Thursday, September the 17th at sundown, and it ends on the 18th at sundown. So we're going to have service here at 1 p.m. on the 18th of September. So we're going to try to clean the place up a little bit before the high days. Um, and the homeless outreach ministry donations needed are bottled water, ground beef, variety packs of chips, hygiene items, deodorant, washcloths, razors, shampoo, conditioner, soap, lotion, toothbrush, toothpaste, and feminine items. Deliver the items by September the 5th because they're going out on the 13th of September to do the, take care of the homeless. Um, what else? You standing over there like you got something? Oh. Okay, so um, that's pretty much it on that, unless somebody else got something. Man. So we're going to close out after the baptism. So once everybody's dressed and ready, we're going to go over a few scriptures and uh, to let you know what you're about to get into. Because, you know, this ain't a good feeling when it comes to us. We want you to pretty much scare you straight to let you know what you're about to get into. And you know the consequences as if you decide to breach the contract. So once they get ready, we're going to... Uh, Y'all can move this now if you want to. Eat these. Standing up. Huh? Never mind. <laughs> Is that enough water? Put some more water up in there, man. Let it run a little more. Not that one. Use the pliers. Yeah, there you go. Wait a minute. We got to move the curtain. The curtain going to get wet. No, just lift it up. Lift that one up. Yeah, we need a little more. Just a little more.
Okay. Okay. Everybody ready? It's hot as fish grease, man. We're gonna go over a few scripts before we before we um now nah, they can sit down. Okay, we're gonna start this off in Matthew. Matthew twenty-eight. We're going to pick it up at verse. We're just going to go over a few things. 28 and 18. Matthew 28 and verse 18. Read it. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. So Jesus said, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go and teach. All nations and then do what? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And you baptize them after you teach them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And it's one name that covers all of them. We're going to read that. And after you teach them and baptize them, what else? Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. So then you're going to be taught again. Because now your journey begins after your baptism because once you come up out that water you are the cleanest person you've ever been and then you use no soap or nothing it's up here you are clean from that point forward and you have to remain clean flip back to Matthew chapter 2 
Matthew 3, I'm sorry, Matthew 3. Because John was baptized. And let's see, he was teaching the people. Matthew 3, and pick it up at verse 1. Matthew 3 and verse 1. Read it. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. So John the Baptist was preaching in the wilderness. What was he preaching? And saying, repent ye. Repent. He was telling the people to repent. And repent means to stop sinning. And sinning is transgression of God's law. We're going to read that. Repent ye, go ahead. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The time is here. Repent. Skip down to four and read it. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leather girdle about his loins. And his meat was locusts and wild honey. So here's a guy with a camel suit eating grasshoppers. Who would want to listen to that guy based on what he's wearing? But it's not about what he was wearing. It's the message he was telling the people. And a lot of people heard that message. Keep reading. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all of Judea and all the region round about Jordan. And were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. So then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about because they heard the message. And they came to do what? Get baptized and confess their sins. Go ahead. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who have warned you to flee from the wrath to come. So the big time religious leaders were coming around to see what John doing. What, what, what kind of following he got? What are you talking about? And he pointed them out right on the spot, called them a generation of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Go ahead. Bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. Bring forth therefore fruits. Fruits of works. Meat means good, and these are your good works to show that you what? Repented, that you stopped sinning. You can't go in the water eating pork and coming out eating pork. You ain't did nothing. You got to make a change in your life, and it starts right up here. Because as long as you're thinking righteous, you're going to act righteous. Keep reading. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now the axe, and now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that bringeth forth not good, therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. That's right. If you ain't bringing forth no good works. Guess what? Going into the fire. You some firewood now. Go ahead. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So skip down to 13. Let's read that. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John. So here come Jesus. From Galilee to Jordan unto John, go ahead. To be baptized of him. To be baptized. Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, got baptized. So if it's good for him, it's definitely good for us. This ain't no spiritual thing. This is physical, which later turns to spiritual up here. But you got to show the Lord that, hey, I'm going to enter into that covenant with you. And the only way to put yourself under the blood of Jesus is to get in that water. Go ahead. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Suffer it to be so, suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. So Jesus said, Look, we got to fulfill all righteousness. So I got to do this. Now let's go to Ezekiel 18 to show you repentance has been around way back here in the Old Testament. Repent, repent means stop sinning, stop sinning. It ain't nothing new. It's been around. Ezekiel 18. And we're going to pick it up. At verse 20. Okay, read. 
the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall, shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. So your righteous works, whatever you do, it's on you. Whether it be righteous or wicked, you're going to pay for it. 21, what does it say? But if the wicked will turn from all the sins that he hath committed, and keep all my statutes, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. So if the wicked will turn from his sins, and in other words, he'll stop breaking God's law, and start keeping the law, he's going to live, go ahead. All his transgressions that he hath committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. In his righteousness that he hath done, he shall live. All the transgressions that he had committed, they're not going to be mentioned. So everything from this point back, whatever foolishness you've done, the Lord is going to wipe it clean. He's going to wipe it away, and now you get a clean start from this point forward. So you have to maintain your white garments. Keep reading. Have I any pleasure at the wick that the wicked should die, saith the Lord God, and not that he should return from his ways and live? So the Lord don't have no pleasure in the wicked dying. He wants them to turn from their wickedness and live. Satan is the one that liked the wicked. He wants you to join him in the lake of fire. Go ahead. But when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity and doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth, shall he live? All his righteousness that he have done shall not be mentioned. In his trespass that he have trespassed and in his sin that he have sinned in them shall he die. So the righteous can turn their back on the Lord too. And the day you do that, and you die in your iniquity, all that righteous stuff you did, just like he wiped away your wickedness for do, when you started doing right, he will wipe away all that righteousness. You could be righteous for 30 years and decide to, all of a sudden, it's an emergency, I got to work on the Sabbath. You're on your way to work, get into a car accident, you're dead. 30 years gone down the drain because you decided to turn from your righteousness. Skip down to verse. Well, keep reading. Yet ye say, the way of the Lord is not equal. Hear now, O house of Israel, is not my way equal? Are not your ways unequal? When a righteous man turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity and dieth in them, for his iniquity that he hath done, shall he die. Again. When the wicked man turneth away from his wickedness that he hath committed and doeth that which is lawful and right, he shall save his soul alive. Because he considereth and turneth away from all his transgressions that he hath committed, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Verse 30. Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, saith the Lord God. So he's going to judge everyone according to their ways. Go ahead. Repent. Repent. Stop sinning and do what? And turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. Cast away from you all your transgressions, whereby ye have transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will you die, O house of Israel? So cast away all your transgressions and do what? Get a new mind. Get a new mind. Go ahead. For I have no pleasure in the death of them that die, saith the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live, ye. Turn yourselves and live. Go to 1 John 3. And repent means to stop sinning. Let's see what sin is. 1 John 3, 1 verse. Verse 4. First John 3 and verse 4. Read it. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. So sin is breaking God's law. And when you repent, you do what? Stop sinning or stop breaking God's law. Go to Acts chapter 2. So now, you decide to get into that covenant. And the Lord said, baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So one name covers all of them. And Peter going to tell you. Acts chapter 2. And this is on the day of Pentecost which we just celebrated a few months ago. 
and pick it up at verse 15. I mean, 36. We'll start at 36 because Peter said a lot of stuff to all those Israelites that was there. And he summed it up right here. Go ahead. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know it surely that God have made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? So when they heard this, they was cut to the heart. And they was like, man, we got to do something. What do we need to do to get ourselves in order? What did Peter tell them? Then Peter said unto them, repent. Repent, stop sinning. And be baptized. Get baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. Every one of you in the name of Jesus. Because Jesus covers all three. Because Jesus said, I come in my father's name. The angel told Mary, you're going to name your son Jesus. And Jesus said, he goes, the Father will send the Holy Ghost in my name. So Jesus covers all three of them. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for what? For the remissions of sins. For the remission of your sins. And we're going to show you what sins, what sins those sins are. Go ahead. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And then you're going to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, which is to do what? Lead you and guide you into all truth. Your understanding and your wisdom. By this word, the Lord is going to pour his spirit out on you. You're going to get some knowledge. Go ahead. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many of, as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Save yourself from this untoward generation. You're the only one that can save you is you. Because you're going to pay for everything wrong that you did, and you're going to pay for everything right that you did. It's up to you, whatever path you choose. Keep reading. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And they that gladly received the word, they got what? Baptized. How many? Go ahead. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. 3,000 people. Now go to Romans chapter 3. I got a couple more places. We're going to get to the Lord's business. Romans 3. Let's look at the remission of sins. Which sins are being remitted? Romans 3. And pick it up at verse 23. Romans 3. And 23. What it say? For all have sinned. And come Everybody has sinned. Go ahead. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through the faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. Remission of sins that are past. So all your past sins have been remitted. Now you act a fool beyond this. Hey, that's between you and God, because he's only going to die for you one time. He ain't dying again. Go ahead. Through the forbearance of God. Okay, flip over to chapter 6. So now you went in that water, you drowned that old man. That's why we submerge you down there and hold you under that water. Chapter 6 and verse 1. What does it say? What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? That's a good question. Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? What's the answer? God forbid. God forbid. Go ahead. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. So when we get baptized and we kill that old individual... That's like Jesus when he went into that grave for three days and three nights when he died. But when he came out three days later, he had a brand new body. So when we get in that water and we come up out of that water, we're supposed to have a brand new mind, a new way of thinking. And if we continue that new way of thinking, we'll eventually get that same body Jesus got. Go ahead. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also shall walk in the newness of life. The newness of life. Go ahead. 
For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So that knowing this, that that old man, just like Jesus got crucified, that old man, which is that former you, is drowned. It's a wrap for that person. Go ahead. For he, for he that is dead is free from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead, in, to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey in the lust thereof. So sin should be a wrap from this point on, up here. Because as long as it's up here and it stays there, guess what? You're going to act on it. That's what we've got to continue to get more of this word up here to push all that foolishness out. Not saying an evil thought. Something's going to happen in ignorance. But when you do stuff intentional against God, that's when you got a problem. Go to, um, we'll keep reading. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God, as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. So we're supposed to be servants of God, and we're supposed to act like it. Go to Acts 19. Acts 19, and I got two more places. Acts 19. Acts 19 and pick it up at verse 1. Okay, read it. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. He said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be in Holy Ghost. So Paul came across some cats and he was like, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe. And they was like, Holy Ghost what? Holy Ghost who? What did they tell him? And he said unto them, unto what then were you baptized? And he said, who baptized you? And what did they tell him? And they said, unto John's baptism. So these were some of John's disciples. They got baptized unto him under John's baptism. But remember, there was nothing wrong with John's baptism. We read that because John baptized Jesus. Go ahead. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people, that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So Paul's on the same page as Peter, baptized in the name of the Lord. And these cats got baptized again, like most of us that have been in this room. You might have been baptized in the name of Jesus from another denomination, or baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. But... That name of Jesus you was baptized under was another Jesus. That was the Sunday Jesus, the Easter Jesus, the Jesus that said you can eat anything you want. The name was right, the doctrine was wrong. So what do you do? You get it done right. Now let's go to Mark 16. Mark chapter 16. And this is for the people that say you don't have to get baptized. It's a spiritual thing. Let's see what the book say. Mark 16 and 15. What it say? And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Go ahead. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes and is baptized gonna be saved. Go ahead. But he that believeth not shall be damned. He that believeth not shall be damned. So if you believe, then you're going to show the Lord you believe and you're going to get baptized. Now let's go to the last place, Luke 15. Luke chapter 15, and then we're going to proceed to the water 
to take care of the Lord's business. Luke 15, and we're going to pick it up at verse 3. Well, we'll start at 1. Luke 15 and 1. Go ahead. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying. So they talk about Jesus. He receiveth sinners and he eateth with them. How is a sinner going to know how to get right if don't know righteous persons tell them? Righteous person instruct them on what righteousness is. So he spoke a parable. What did he say? What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. So he got a hundred sheep. One of them go astray. It ain't like he writing it all. I got 99 over here. He go out there and he get that one sheep. Go ahead. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over 90 and 9 just persons which need no repentance. So likewise I shall be over. Joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth than over 99 just persons that don't need no repentance. Verse 8. Either what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house, and seek diligently till she find it. And when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the piece which I had lost. So here's a woman with ten pieces of silver, lost one. And she's looking high and low, trying to find it. And when she find it, she real happy. It's a big party now, calling all her friends, Rejoice with me. Because I found that which I lost. Go ahead. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repented. So likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in heaven in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repented. And we got four right here. So you know they partying up there right now. So we're going to proceed to the water and take care of the Lord's business, and then we're going to say a prayer and close out. No, I'm good. Okay. That sounds good. Sister Ernestine, do you believe that Jesus Christ was God in the beginning, was born of a virgin, died, was raised from the dead, and is sitting on the right hand of the Father in the third heaven? I believe that, yes. Sister Ernestine, we baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ, 
for the remission of your past sins, that you may receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Come over here when she get done. Praise the Lord. Stand right here, Mom. Right there, right there, right there. Watch out. Yeah. There we go. Sister Dashe, do you believe that Jesus Christ was God in the beginning, born of a virgin, died, was resurrected, is on a, and is on the right hand of the Father in the third heaven? Yes, I do. Sister Dashe, we baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your past sins that you may receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Brother Trey, do you believe that Jesus Christ was God in the beginning, born of a virgin, died, and was resurrected, and is on the right hand of the Father? Yes, I do believe. Brother Trey, we baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your past sins, that you may receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Hold your breath. <laughs> Brother Nick, do you believe that Jesus Christ was God in the beginning, born of a virgin, died, was resurrected, and is on the right hand of the Father? Most definitely. Brother Nick, we baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your past sins, that you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Okay, we're going to close out. Y'all come on over here. Let's get some hands over here. Priest, friend. <laughs> Our Father which art in heaven. Our Father which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth. Thy will be done in earth. As it is in heaven. As it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts. And forgive us our debts. As we forgive our debtors. As we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. For thine is the kingdom. And the power. And the power. And the glory. And the glory. Forever. Forever. Merciful God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we commend these souls to you. We have done as you have instructed that you have left for Israel to do, which is baptize in your name for the remission of past sins. Lord, we pray that you keep these souls 
enhance their understanding, Lord. Let them be your servants in spirit and in truth and in fear. We pray, Lord, that you protect them. And we pray all these things, that you would give them the gift of your Holy Spirit until your kingdom come. And everyone say amen. 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 It is done. Hallelujah. 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 In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God.